Welcome to the Energy Central Power Talk titled, Towards a Truly Integrated Grid Evolving Demand Response. As a community platform with a goal to help professionals in the industry to share, learn, and connect in a collaborative environment, Energy Central Power Talks are a short 20 to 30 minute session focused around a topic that we feel is of interest to the industry and our community members. Power Talks are bring together industry experts to share their expertise through a recorded video session. Energy Central members are able to interact around the Power Talk topic by using the discussion features in the community asking questions or sharing knowledge and experience with other power industry members. This session is brought to you by Sensor Suite, your seasoned team of experts utilizing intelligence building automation systems to eliminate emissions from our society. I'm pleased to present today's speakers, Glenn Spry and David St. Germain. Glenn Spry, CEO and President at Sensor Suite, is a former energy utility executive with extensive knowledge of Asia Pacific, European, and North American energy markets. Glenn is now applying his detailed knowledge of distributed energy resource business models to accelerate the transition of our grid to a cleaner, greener, and more customer centric environment. David St. Germain is the CTO of Hilo, a subsidiary of Hydro Quebec, building the virtual power plant and aggregation ecosystems for the province. Hilo integrates a wide range of residential and commercial IoT technologies to provide diversified energy control solutions to Hydro Quebec. The company was founded two years ago and now has 135 employees. Welcome, Glenn and David, to the community. You now have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Audra. It's a, um, a pleasure to be here today, and, and it's, a, it's an amazing um, privilege to be joined by David St. Germain to discuss demand response and the evolution of uh, the intelligent grid. I think to, to get us uh, started, I might uh, throw to David to give us uh, the definition of demand response to, to set the scene. So, David, um, what is demand response? Oh, I think demand response is the capacity of different assets on the network to provide for curtailing ability uh, for a utility. And for me, that means that you have a set of technologies or a set of behaviors that allow the utility to influence behavior in the house or in uh, or a commercial building. And you know that allows them to curtail peak demand. Nice, nice. Uh, look, back in the day um, uh, in New Zealand, uh, I ran one of the uh, demand response programs down there. Um, I cut my teeth really trying to understand the, the the concept, the idea of a smart grid. Now, I think over time, I've, I've managed to sort of iterate that, and it, I really landed on this this um, you know I, there's a, a, quite a terminology coined in market now of a, of a virtual power plant. And I think that's really the manifestation of of a, of a true um, uh, smart grid. The, the thing for me though is when I look at a smart grid it's and a virtual power plant for that matter it's really about an entity that is not necessarily real it's not it's not a classic generator it's not a windmill it's not a solar panel so when you're looking at demand response what is it that you're chasing I mean are, are you looking at specific resources or is it really just, is it a capacity game that you're playing I think that really depends on what needs you're trying to address, right? Um, I don't think it's just about capacity, but it's it's more about how you orchestrate all the different hardware components that you have under control to achieve the utility's objective. And in our case, uh, in Helo's case, for example, the first product that we tackled was winter peak demand shaving. When there's cold spells, you know, you have uh, very high demand for, for heating energy. And that's a very precise um, scenario that you have to control for. You have very precise control curves that are set by the utility, which you have to follow. So, of course, we had to begin by putting together a set of devices that could allow us to control that. And that's mainly line voltage thermostats, HVAC in buildings, and also partnering up with Sensor Suite in the, uh, um, you know, centrally controlled rental building uh, uh, heating space. Um, and then we had to build out control models for each of these technologies that will allow us to fit the control curve as tightly as possible. 
So now we're already looking past that space to widen the control possibilities. And I think we're, we're gonna be adding water heater systems, smart car chargers to the mix. And we're really working on uh, you know, furthering our control ecosystem in the smart house, but also in smart buildings by adding centrally controlled 24 volt thermostats, battery systems, and a wide range of devices um, that will add different types of capacity elements to what we're already controlling. The thing is, some of these technologies are not ready for prime time yet from the cost mm. perspective. You know, if you, uh, if you take into account the whole value stream that's generated for the trading desk, for production, for transport, distribution, and for the end customer, you have to figure out the ROI and whether that makes sense from the perspective of introducing a new technology. So for instance, if you take batteries, um, you know, you can look at batteries and see that there is probably three large valuation categories for, for batteries. You can limit costs for the utility by doing frequency control, by supporting trading forecasts, by supporting production forecasts, um, or you can also manage peak power for the customer. So, you know, you can limit costs in those ways. You can also defer investments. You can do voltage control, um, freeing up reserve power, uh, peak power. And finally, you can do price arbitrage. Uh, you can help the trading desk really get under the market and, and uh, understand how they can best manage all of these assets. So in Quebec, the economics of batteries don't make that much sense compared to other markets. You know, if you know Australia very well, California <laughs> is another market where batteries make a lot of sense because you can back them up with solar power and the energy prices are high enough that you can um, get ROI on, on that battery system and the customers mm -hmm. actually invested themselves into that system. In Quebec, that's not the case. You get winter with a lot of snow and the energy prices are really low. So for us, I think that system is not ready for prime time yet, but it'll get there if the price drops by a, a factor of three, maybe, you know, for, for these types of system. And that means that the utility has to foot 100% of the bill for, for these types of things. So to get back to the products that we're introducing, as I said, we started with the line voltage thermostats and now we're expanding into water heaters and car chargers. And these products free up capacity year long. It's not just a winter peak shaving product. It's something that we can use to curtail uh, and to do frequency all year long. So there's more practical aspects to consider also when you're deploying these types of technologies. For instance, water heaters have a natural life cycle. Every 10 years, you need to replace them. So that's a great opportunity yeah. to step in and change the technology. And that's something that we're looking at as well. So, you know, to wrap it up, I don't think it's just about capacity. I think it's about the richness of the types of assets that you can bring together to orchestrate complex behavior. It's an interesting one because um, look, I, I've always been fascinated by the, um, the the Quebec market, the energy market here. It's by, by default, it's, it's a fairly clean one. Um, but it comes with its own unique challenges. Um, and it sounds like what you're trying to build is is really a tool that's going to support the grid, not necessarily of today, but of tomorrow. Yeah, you know, and I, you've, you've mentioned a couple of technologies there. Um, stationary storage is one of them. Um, for, for those that don't know, Quebec has issued a, a mandate that says that uh, there will be no internal combustion engine vehicles sold beyond 2030. Now, when you're deploying many, many different types of technologies, many different iterative um, versions of technologies. It becomes quite an interesting environment to, to really, um, you know, I guess, play the role that you're playing. So if we were to look a little bit further afield and, and sort of understand the, the electrification of everything, that, that seems to be hot on everyone's lips. What challenges do you see tomorrow as the electrification of e everything unfolds in Quebec? That's a super question. and. I think to understand that you need to step back and take a look at what I think for me are the two main parallel goals of that transition. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is that we wanna decarbonize society as quickly as possible. Yeah. And in Quebec, uh, that means that we need to support a transition to electric vehicles, but we also need to use hydro power plants to support the introduction of spikier renewable assets like, like wind and solar. And secondly, uh, you need to maximize revenue and minimize investment during that transition. Uh, you you mm -hmm. still need to make money as a utility, right? So solving the spikiness problem is key to answering that question. Y you need consumption to be efficient, 
predictable and as linear as possible. And that means that you need flexibility in consumption and production habits. You need to orchestrate behaviors at the customer's level to statistically balance out that production and consumption. So every, all of these little components floating around on the grid need to act together and be orchestrated by a central all-knowing system that everything feeds into in order to make it as efficient as possible. In other words, you need a bunch of different assets with different electrical signatures that you can pull from the different scenarios that you're trying to control for. And in my mind, tools like virtual power plants are going to become mainstream. You need these tools to be able to electrify transport. You need them to connect assets and to provide grid stability. And you need to do that while being as transparent to the customer as possible. How are you using their data? You know, do they feel comfortable in these scenarios? So we don't have a choice. Um, connecting all these EVs and renewables is going to invert the traditional distribution architecture. And that's going to happen in the next 10 years. It's not something that's <laughs> far down the line, you know? So to answer your question more directly, I think the challenges are both technological and behavioral. Um, people have to understand and accept the fact that modulating energy consumption in real time is the way to a cleaner future. That means that all of the underlying technology needs to work smoothly and we need efficient software interconnections between all of these different systems, aggregators, utilities. We need standard ways of communicating, forecasting, doing bid ask, data streaming technologies, reliability, cybersecurity, you know, we could go on and on and on. What's mm -hmm. certain is that it'll involve a lot of different actors and we'll need to find ways of involving society to get there. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, like what I hear is that pretty much the blueprint for, for the utility of the future or the grid of the future, right? Um, there are a couple of things to, to pull out of that. There's the, um, the, the predictable, the, the linear, the efficient, um, grid of the future. Now, if we look at the, the current tools of today, if we say demand response was, I think it's pretty, pretty fair to split um, them into two categories. One is behavioral and one is technical. The, 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 look, the, the reality of it is that you know, behavioral has, um, behavioral DR has got a bit of bad rap over the years. It's notoriously unreliable. I mean, you get a nice spike at the beginning of the, of the call, but towards the end, everyone either gets too warm, too cold and goes, um, no, I prefer just to have my heat back on. But in, in your mind, then, where, where does behavioral and, and technical DR fit? I mean, what, what, what do you prefer? Well, maybe let me just step back a second and explain mm -hmm. to the viewers um, what is behavioral and what is technical DR in case they aren't aware of the definitions. In behavioral DR, users are responding to an external incentives and they're manually programming behaviors or acting on their environment to get to the results that the utility wants, but they're not exposed to the exact technical specifications of those requirements. They're just being told, this is a price signal, please act accordingly. So everyone gets to interpret that in their own way and gets to implement it in their own way. Right. You can incentivize through different means, but it's still down to a user's preference. In technical demand response, those behaviors are automated or they're assisted by software or hardware. So you can use IoT devices, you can send commands to them from a cloud ecosystem, you can accompany and learn from the user's behavior to get it to be more predictable and to align to a set of specifications that is more tightly bound to what the utility is actually looking for. Right. So, for me, I think there's a third category in there, which we haven't mentioned, which bridges the gap between the two, mm -hmm. uh, be between the behavioral and the technical, and that's coaching systems. We can learn from the user, we can learn from the population as a whole, and we can steer people towards better behavior. We can add programming to people's houses through their smart home ecosystem to accompany them into reaching the equilibrium that we're looking for, but we can also directly control their devices and reward them with monetary incentives so that they don't feel uh, as, uh, um, as, as you know, they, they don't have to really do as many steps themselves to get to the end result. Right. So I, I think both behavioral and technical DR are complementary. 
but the yeah. technical driven aspects deliver a lot more value. Behavioral demand response mm -hmm. can't follow curves. It, it can't generate, yeah. it can generate secondary peaks and that's really bad for the infrastructure. Um, but technical can orchestrate across a wide range of scenarios. Uh, it doesn't depend on, on goodwill and that means that it is less fragile and more predictable than the behavioral aspects. So maybe the last aspect is that technical BR, I think, can be built into a virtual power plant architecture. And yeah. that means that um, you can control resources that are less obvious to the user. I'm thinking of water heaters. I'm thinking right. of uh, batteries, uh, vehicle to house, vehicle to grid. These are not obvious things. You can't program them like a thermostat. So as we move into this more complex world, we're going to need the technicity of the aspects to be abstracted from the user. Right. It's uh, look. I hadn't actually thought of the um, the, the coaching um, idea there. And uh, you know, from experience, if I look um, closer to home uh, in Ontario, where the ICO program, um, GA busting or global adjustment, uh, the global adjustment system there, you know, I I'd probably liken that to a bit more gamification. You know, there, there's you know, a sizable amount of value for the uh, for the customer there to curtail load. It's it's uh, I yeah I think you know, I think it'd be fair to say it's probably one of the more valuable um, markets for storage. You know, uh, 2019 it was worth about seven hundred thousand dollars per megawatt of curtailed load, but it is gamified. You you chase the five peaks, and you know I think what we've seen there is it's it's um, certainly commanded a lot of investment um, on behalf of the customer into into that market. Um, the ISO, you know, they put up um, their, their side of it with the um, the monetary compensation, the compensation for um, for curtailing in those peaks. But one of the things that you know, I look at is I, I, the challenge here is how how does the utility value these resources? I mean, I think the ISO through the um, uh, ICI program curtails about fourteen hundred megawatts. For the top five hours of, of system peaks. Now that that's that's not a small amount of energy, and by default, that's actually probably quite valuable um, to the ISO and uh, you know, to have that on call. But I'm intrigued from your side. How, how does a utility in your mind value that DR capacity? Now you're you're asking me a tricky question. <laughs> But my experience is that a lot of utilities often haven't done the full end-to-end -end analysis. You know, they, they haven't done their comparative cost streams and they're getting trouble doing that because they are huge entities. Um, they're often split into silos and you need to have end-to-end -end data to get that to happen. Yeah. So in general, I think there is three large value categories for utilities, but I'm sure there's a lot more than, than that, but these are the ones that come off the top of my head. Uh, you have deferred investments. So this applies both to transport and distribution, and that's mostly mm -hmm. about right-sizing your equipment, right? Right. In our case, we can reduce seasonal peaks, and that means like not having to scale your infrastructure to support a few dozen days of bad cold spells. Um, right and reducing energy imports or maximizing exports. You know, you, yeah. you you see the deal there. But to defer investments, you can also apply control strategies to more specific geographies like a neighborhood um, mm -hmm. to manage peaks in that area. And that means that you can defer investment for uh, equipments that are undersized or aging. Um, and there's a lot of value in that geographical uh, space where, where you can, you know, refine your control. Mm -hmm. Then you can also manage power better coming back from power cuts uh, and, and you can, especially in the context of electric vehicle introduction, we will yeah. see huge spikes in charging when you come back from a power failure. Yeah. This can blow up your equipment and can damage the equipment. Mm -hmm. So planning for that, having control over that, being able to spread that over time is something that's very interesting in terms of uh, the evolution of demand response. So the first right. category is deferred investment in my mind. Yeah. The second category is freeing up contingency reserves and that's done through better frequency management, um, very short-term assets, you know, like batteries, something that you can act upon within a few seconds or even sub-second uh, time spans, mm -hmm. closer to the hardware, right? Something that you can yeah. control, modulate, but closer to the hardware or ve with very, very tight control loops. And that allows you to sell that power elsewhere as well, 
right? Because you are freeing yeah. up that reserve, you have like huge capacity that you can then export or that you can value at a higher price point. So it's tricky in the sense that you really have to trust your DR system to be reliable when you're using it to, uh, to do frequency yeah. control. The third option I think is about uh, financial arbitrage and maximizing your revenue, which basically means that you're providing control products that a trading desk can pull from. And right. I think this is analogous to what trading desk did in the 90s and, and 2000s when they set up all of these low, low latency interconnects. You know, they actually mm -hmm. built fiber in between the offices so right. they could shave a few milliseconds off the trade options and, and, and get a little more uh, money out of that. Well, virtual power plants will open up the same types of scenarios for low latency trading for energy because you can act on a spot market for energy across geographies. So that's quite interesting to me as well. And mm. I, I just thought of a fourth one as I was speaking. <laughs> um, I, I think there's competitive advantages as well that can be drawn from better grid management. If you manage to uh, run your grid more efficiently and you don't have to build a new power plants to provide peak demand, you can pass those savings off to the customer and be more competitive wow. on the market. So as I said, lots of you know ways to, to value this for utilities, but the, the real challenge is in figuring out the value stream within the utility to justify these investments. Yeah, it's an issue because you bring in the customer um, towards the end there. And I think you know you've you've um you've given some great examples of how you know, the the value that can be created through these programs um, can be realized by the utility. But there are there are two sides to the DR coin. You know, the, the, the true nature of demand response is asking the demand side to curtail you know, based on a signal, based on the needs and whims of a, um, of a, of a system event or a system in general. You know, but Census Suite, we, we look at and we operate primarily in the multi-unit residential building stock. You know, luckily for us, um, you know, there's an uncanny correlation between when multi-unit residential buildings consume energy and system peaks. You know, the type of assets that, that we integrate into, predominantly HVAC assets, you know, winter peaking um, assets here in, in, um, in Quebec. But if you were to talk to a REIT customer today, um, a real estate investment trust uh, customer who owns a portfolio of uh, maybe a couple of hundred buildings, where would you, uh, where, where's the value for them in this? Because they're, they're integral to the process, right? You, there is no demand response without the demand actually responding. Yeah, for sure. And that's nice because we were talking about this one this morning uh, w with you, you know. Um, I think the most important one for me is because it's the right thing to do with regards to our climate goals. But that's a very personal feeling. Yeah. Uh, that being said, I, I think you can split the value prop into two categories, the direct mm -hmm. and indirect advantages. And right. in the direct advantages, there are, of course, the monetary incentives that the, the people or the businesses get for participating in the program. In Hilo's case, um, that means that building owners get paid explicitly. So it's not just because you're reducing mm -hmm. power consumption, you're getting uh, a monetary value for each kilowatt hours that you're displacing during, during peak. But at the same time, you do get to lower your bill because they're often, often associated with a reduction in uh, peak power. And in Quebec, that has a huge impact on your bill. And I'm sure pretty much everywhere in the world that has a huge impact on your bill. Um, another direct one is reducing the dependence on generators in favor of batteries, um, which can both handle mm -hmm. peak and blackouts. And you get the added benefit of not having to buy fuel. And as we're seeing right now on the world markets, I mean, it's only going to get worse, right? Yeah, yeah. So indirect advantages, um, I think the top one, as I said, is environmental impact. Your, your buildings account for around 40% of the world's energy consumption. That's huge. I mean, it, yeah. you can't understate that. And the climate and financial impacts of savings in this category can be very substantial. So both for the goodwill aspect of building the future for our children, but also for the fact that you're actually putting money back in your pocket if you're doing something about your building. But how do you measure it? And that's always the question I get back to, you know, what's the yardstick? So there's now certifications that you can get um, mm -hmm. by demonstrating efficient energy management. And I think those play positively in company culture. Um, they, yeah. they can boost employee pride, they can boost engagement but also it shows that you can implement efficient management practices that generate uh, long-term value streams. 
And a lot of investment portfolios now are looking at these types of, of investment strategies where they're trying to be greener, they're, they're trying to look at the certifications that the mm. company have achieved. So for me, you know, uh, direct and indirect, really, uh, really interesting. Th there's a final point that I didn't touch upon in the, uh, in the direct ones, which is regulatory compliance. And I like to look at the European market um, to, mm -hmm. to get a better understanding of that because I feel that you know they're they're ahead of what we're doing in North America on many of these aspects because they've they've dealt with them for the past 15, 20 years already. Yeah. Um, and in Europe, you know, uh, they've been pushing for energy efficiency in buildings through regulatory compliance. The goals are clear. The reporting is mandatory. Buildings mm -hmm. are responsible for 40% of EU energy consumption and 36% of greenhouse gas emissions. 75% of, of the building stock is energy inefficient, but only 1% gets renovated each year. So there's a huge market there. Wow. There's a huge potential. And wrapping back to one of your previous questions, I, I think coaching technologies, piggybacking mm. on virtual power plant techs, can help owners, you know, target what to do in terms of efficient efficiency and demand response, and really help them mitigate some of that old building stuff. Um, yeah. The reduced spend, the increased revenue can also help by, you know, uh, contributing to a part of the renovation cost that these buildings. A need to go through in order to get that one percent to become two percent or three yeah. percent and i think i read a study recently that said that renovation of existing buildings in europe can lead the european union to cut uh, its co2 emissions by five percent and to mm -hmm. reduce the energy consumption of the whole european bloc by five to six percent so you know if you look closer to home let's say in ontario mm. i think we started moving a little bit in that direction yeah. and the government has implemented regulation that says that buildings over a hundred thousand square feet that's ten thousand square meters um need to divulge their energy expenditure and i hope that's going to be followed by more regulation to allow them to better curtail uh their their power consumption and, mm. and be tracked over time but what's your take on this yeah it's an interesting one because what, what we see right now is is it's so hard to get that information out i mean if we look at just the invoices and add those invoices up over over 12 months you don't get a complete picture in these buildings so you it's really hard to to quantify a the savings or the energy performance within the buildings i mean from a uh, an economic standpoint that we know that if you can save one dollar uh, in operational expense within that building that returns 28 dollars in um, increased asset value so it's using a cap rate of about three and a half percent. So there's there's a definite correlation between reducing expenditure and increasing asset value. When it comes to the the, the broader um, sort of energy efficiency um, goals within the building, it, it's look I, I I think from our side we we're starting to see the technology mature. Right, you cannot pull accurate consumption information you cannot verify um, that you've invested money in energy efficiency and you've seen savings without having that telemetry um, come out of the building and in very high resolution so when we look at what's happening here i think we're seeing technology now starting to to reach a point of maturity where it supports a lot of that because quite frankly if you are having to report on your energy efficiency measures or the the um, the outcomes of those without the information without that uh, that data coming out it makes it very difficult to prove that you've actually delivered on your um, on your goals but the thing is that this is almost come, comes back full circle because by deploying this technology by digitizing these assets not only are you able to increase the asset value by just energy efficiency you're digitizing the environment to a point where it can actually participate in these programs and generate more income by default increasing that asset value even further so we're we're at a very interesting time where i think technology has just hit this point of maturity where now it is able to to participate in in programs that it was never able to so i i'm i'm obviously quite bullish on this fact i mean as we spoke of this morning the the world is changing the, the grid of today is not going to be the grid of tomorrow it is uh, I said to you, I think um, on January 1st, 2030, I'm, I'm going to look back and go, wow, what a wild ride the 2020s were for energy efficiency, demand response, and this this new smart grid that uh, that we're building. But I look, um, 
David, I, I, I want to extend my, my thanks for joining us today. I, hopefully the audience has, has picked up a couple of things that they may not have known uh, before listening to this podcast. But essentially, we're on a journey now. Uh, it is one that is um, driven by the need to decarbonize our grids. We realize that the grid of tomorrow is certainly different. It comes with its own unique challenges. And um, excited to be to be working with someone and an entity um, like you and someone like yourself who kind of gets the fact that we need to do this now. You know, we, we can't wait to the end of this decade um, to, to sort of look through that rearview mirror and go, OK, what do we do now? The fact is we're front footing this. So, um, David, I'd like to say again, a quick thanks for, for joining us today. Um, and uh, yeah, all the best for the 2020s. Thank you so much, Glenn. It was great being here today. Thank you.